This episode is sponsored by Noble. The Noble Floral Collection is now available. Head over to nobleproject.com and shop the official footwear and apparel partner of CrossFit. Welcome back to the Cross Games Podcast. I'm your host, Chase Inger, with Adrian Conway and Adrian Bosman, as we are going to go behind the programming of the age group semifinals, which just wrapped up this weekend. Scores are on the board. The leaderboard's there for everybody to see now. Everybody's happy and seeing the moving and shaking now that uh, we're doing a little video review out there. And uh, I tell you what, it's been a, been a wild weekend. It's cool to see the tests. It's nice to see things on board, but... Uh, I, I feel like there's been some wild movement <laughs> top to bottom uh, as that leaderboard's getting updated with video review and, uh, and yep. uh, scores and what I thought was, I mean, that's, that's how it always goes, right guys. It's like, you see that. And then until, what is it, Boz? When is the, it, the date to where uh, things will be finalized is I think I saw with around the 10th. Yeah. May 10th is our official uh, close. Yep, exactly. And you know, if we can get it wrapped up sooner than that, then we will, and we'll make an announcement if we can uh, make that happen. But May 10th is the official locking of the leaderboard date. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Especially at this stage of the season, you know, we've only got 30 athletes in the division, um, especially in some of the more competitive divisions. I mean, there are plenty of athletes that can be within that striking distance of, uh, of 10th place on any given day. So it's a dog fight, you know, there's a, there's a lot of close, <laughs> performances that are really going to dictate what happens. I, I remember. So, the, the so you're saying don't buy your ticket yet. You don't <laughs> buy your tickets yet. <laughs> don't, don't, yeah, I mean, yeah, posts on Instagram. It's like, it depends. I mean, buy. if your name's Scott Panchik, I think you're pretty <laughs> safe. But, uh, but there's plenty of other people on the bubble that, um, you know, yeah, you got to see how it shakes out. Oh, there was a lot of tight races that, you know, uh, Adrian and I got to go through the, uh, the list on Sunday when uh, the scores were due. Obviously nothing's finalized yet, as you said. And, there's just tight races at the top, tight mm -hmm. races at the bottom. I mean, we see people separated by six or seven spots on the leaderboard with a total of, what, 20 points at the most. And yeah. what I've already seen is just every, I think, two hours I check in, I'm like, whoa, there's something new. So it's, a, it's like a never-ending excitement tailing off the weekend. It's been pretty crazy. Yeah, for sure. And, and that's kind of the fun thing about the uh, age group categories, too, is that there's so many of them. You know what I mean? It's not just one race. There are so many races that are interesting and so many athletes that you can pick on these leaderboards. And you're like, man, this person's been around for five, six, ten years mm -hmm. and they're still at it and they're still in the mix. I mean, it's so cool and, and fun to follow for that reason. It is a really unfortunate thing that we had such, um, you know, uh, problems with the leaderboard uh, over the weekend. So people couldn't be as close to those races. So you know, shout out to the team for resolving that. And, um, you know, apologies to the fans and uh, athletes that it wasn't possible during the competition. But at least now things are fixed and, uh, and they're good to go. Yep. You guys want to see the updated leaderboard, as you said, Boz, go to games.cross.com and check that leaderboard out for the age group semifinal division. And Boz, as he says, like names, people that have been in the game for a long time. What I, always catches me off is I'll be like, OK, I'm in this division and I'm I know someone was in that previous one and then their name pops up I'm like, Oh, totally forgot about that person. There they like, are. Oh, I can't yep. believe they're in this division now. But what I thought was really cool was not just the athletes that we, we know over the years and have made a name for themselves in the sport, but I, I think this goes along to what we've wanted to see more on maybe the individual side, but the global representation in the top 10 in every division is Unlike anything I think I remember, and I could just be wrong, just I haven't paid as much of attention, but there's five or six different countries represented, it seems like, in every division, both male and female, from top to bottom age. Yeah, for sure. It's a very cool to, uh, to see that emerge. Um, and honestly, it's one of those things that's really difficult as we start to look into, hey, maybe one day we're going to have a Masters semifinals that's in person. You know, like I can't promise that. That's... That's certainly uh, not something that I'm trying to uh, announce or allude to on this podcast, but it's one of those things that we're always looking at, like, okay, what's the next step? And if it is live and in-person competition, how do we do that in a way that we can make sure that, hey, we got a division that's got, like you said, six or seven different countries from all over the globe represented. What's fair to expect uh, you know, out of the competitors? So a great thing to, uh, to see emerge, that's for sure. And man, the fact that you can have that many fit people throughout the span of their life 
all over the place. I mean, that's what it's all about. So yeah, that's, it's very, very cool. I love that. That's music, that's music to my ears too. I, I just got to say, Buzz, you know, sometimes I, I hear things from within the community um, where people are like, hey, what's, what's CrossFit doing? They're looking out for us. Do they want this to be a highlighted event? Do they want us to get an opportunity to showcase our skills? And I'm just so glad that you mentioned that because I think it's relieving, hopefully, to our community for them to understand that, of course, if we can make it happen, there are things that we're going to make happen to highlight each and every athlete that are able to qualify and advance their season. But with the master's category, and I'm just going to go ahead and say that I can relate experience in 2021 when I was out there on the competition floor and we had like a million age group athletes in the back competing. <laughs> that is a really hard group to manage and to, you know, make sure that everyone's taken care of in the way, the same ways that the individual athletes are, because that pool is so much slower, not to mention yeah. that everybody in these age groups are hmm. career based individuals, right? I mean, we've got people that work, we're not any longer just professional exercisers at that level. And so there's, there's so many things to consider, but I, I really appreciate you bringing that up. And even if it is a dream down the road for us, I think it's awesome to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. It's actually already been clipped and printed and, and <laughs> it's official folks. Yeah. Sorry guys. It's, I just got a, my update text is like, you heard it here <laughs> first. Yeah. Boz announces new season structure. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Boss, before we get into the programming, you know, Adrian, you were talking about the CrossFit games and, and that vibe. And, you know, you've been there on the floor in many different ways, steeped like with those athletes in the corrals and on the competition floor. What's really the difference in parallel between the two? Because I've heard athletes talk about it, you know, like Conway has talked about. It. I've heard Hobart talk about just like the, the different vibe that's in maybe the, the corral or when people are standing on the competition floor in the age group division than maybe say the individual division where, you know, there, there's a lot of, not to say there's less at stake for the age groupers, but it seems like it's, it's more that backyard old school buddies in, you know, fitness competition. When we say go, we're all serious, but at the end it's like hugs, high fives and butt pats. Do, do you feel a different energy with the age groupers maybe when, or v vice versa with the individuals? Oh my um, goodness. For me or for, for that Adrian? Yeah, I was I wasn't sure who you I, I you go start. first, Conway. Start you go first. Names. Hey, I, yeah. I, I'll I'll go as a participant, and I I can say that it it's it's everything that that people would imagine it being in regards to a reunion of sorts, right? For any of us, for me, my history within the space, being able to be a part of a level one seminar staff and being at the games on a team, and all the way back to to 2012 for my first experience, it's like. I'm at the age and in the age group where when I get back there, I'm seeing people, one, that forged the way for me athletically in our space where I looked up to them and they're now in the 45 to, to 50 or 50 to 55 age demographic. And I'm like, whoa, I mean, just com complete legends with families and careers, of course, like I mentioned. So when they get back there, we are absolutely competing. There's no doubt about it. But in between events, we're talking about our careers and our families and mm -hmm. our war stories from when we were going individually or out there on a team Back or the, the really, day. yeah, man, or the really dumb mistakes that we made throughout our training years when we were young. And we wished we had people that were a little older and experienced like, yo, hey, don't do that. Do this instead or actually <laughs> rest Take when it G says rest. Day, Conway. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's a great experience, man. One that, one that, you know, I'll, I'll never forget, uh, being back there in 2021. Yeah. And you can definitely feel kind of the difference, um, you know, on the, I don't know, competition administrative side, I suppose, mm -hmm. if that's a <laughs> clunky way <laughs> to say it, but, um, yeah, I mean, you know, you've got the individual athletes and those guys are just in the pressure cooker. It's all a lot of, a lot of tension uh, oftentimes with those athletes, um, teams, same kind of deal, but I find, especially with some of the older divisions, you know, like they have such a camaraderie, uh, mm -hmm. within their division. It's only 10. Uh, so it's a small group. I think they can get to kind of know each other a little bit better. Um, and I think back to, you know, last year, so this was 22, uh, in Madison and particularly like the 60 plus and 65 plus women, man, they were having such a great time yeah. together. You know, they were all cutting up and making jokes and, you know, making jokes at the head judge's expense. And they, I mean, it was just great. You know, it was awesome to see um, how they kind of turned that into their own event in that regard. And, and that's one of those things that I think, you know, you can't necessarily see unless you have that kind of behind the scenes, um, pull back the curtain type of view. Yeah. But man, it's really fun to see that emerge for sure.
Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's cool. One day, oh, one day, I'll get back there. I'll get back there. For, it's looking like forty-five might be my. <laughs> Although I went and looked at all the results from the semifinal, I'm like, maybe. Oh, they're animals. And then I'm like, maybe I like, <laughs> yeah, I might be kicking that can down the road for a while, but better start uh, training. <laughs> yeah. So let's shift our focus uh, to the age group semifinals. But, um, you know, Boz, big picture since uh, for the first time since 2018, we're getting a standardized competition from open through the CrossFit games. And it's wild to think that we're, it's what, almost five years yeah. since we got to have that. Now, the age group track is a little bit different, right? Their semifinal events will, you know, well, I don't know what the individuals are, but, you know, the quarterfinals events are different and the semifinals could be, you know, a different base off that. But with this track is, when you, when you look at the whole season, do you storyboard it a little bit as far as kind of what you want to see from like open quarters, semis, games and and do you build upon that so it, it, maybe with weight skills uh volume and intensity how, how do you open the whole or look at the whole big picture basically going into the season yeah, yeah the the short answer is yes um there's definitely some storyboarding like you said that goes on from okay what does it look like to enter the season and then play all the way through there's an element of that um but i think the balance is that you can't get too caught up in that because at all stages of competition, you have to at least represent most of the elements that are important if you're trying to find who's got the most breadth of fitness. Mm -hmm. So if you were to play that completely linearly and meaning like, okay, you only see rudimentary skills during the open and you only see the most advanced skills during the games and you never have any overlap between those points in the season, um, I think it's going to filter in a way that doesn't necessarily allow the best to always excel. Okay. Um, so you do have to be careful with that because at the end of the day, it's one thing to just be able to do the race. Uh, it's another to be able to continue to win the race when those peers are stacked up against you uh, under various conditions. So yeah, it's, it's fun to kind of have those through lines. I think that's always going to be a feature of the game season is you're going to see some things that kind of build on themselves, mm -hmm. um, but it can't be the only sorting mechanism and, and nor should it be the most important. Well, when you look at <clears throat> the other thing that we shifted is we, with the semifinals, and I, I don't know if this is a product of just a smaller grouping, but, you know, opens quarters ha also have a different like system of scoring. Yeah. Right. And so the open quarters is points per place in, you know, old school regionals and games is also that to a certain extent. And then we shifted more to delegated points for a finishing place. So a hundred point tier system, depending on the number of athletes taking the test or, you know, these skills sets that we've seen at the games and before, and maybe a different scoring system. When you look at the shift from quarters to semis, what about that scoring shift is, is important to you or, or a reason behind that when you shift the different system to this different level of competition? Yeah, there's some pragmatic elements that come into play. Uh, number one, when we look at the first stages of the season, meaning the open and the quarters particularly, you, know, you can kind of lump them as these mass participation type events, meaning there are you know, thousands of competitors, tens of thousands sometimes in certain divisions. And uh, we also don't know the total number of competitors that will be happening uh, or, or who's going to sign up um, oftentimes until we have that first competition window closed. So it's very hard to build a meaningful points table off of an unknown like that. You also have the benefit of numbers, right? So the scale kind of happens organically in the sense that if I've got 10,000 competitors in my division and I'm not very good at something, it's going to create a pretty big deficit for me to overcome naturally. I don't have to worry about a points table to do that. Mm -hmm. So when we shift gears into a smaller competition where number one, we know the total number of competitors in the field, it's, it's capped in this case at 30. Um, you know, it, now we can assign a meaningful points table to that, that creates that same kind of spread and highlights, okay, if you have a weakness, you won't be able to kind of save yourself because there's not as many people between you and first place, let's say, you know, a couple hundred won't be able to slip in between you, but it still needs to be reflected that, Hey, you weren't very good at that. And therefore it shows up in the ranking. So we don't want to divide a hundred point score by a hundred thousand 
people. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that's uh, easy for anybody to follow and not necessary, right? Because yeah. again, it's just, we have the benefit of those types of numbers participating. It makes it pretty simple. The granularity is there. So it's and it also, well, and, and right. the second thing on that, that I, I didn't mention is that it does allow us to start weighting things with different levels of importance. And we've seen that throughout the history of the games. You know, there's often a hundred point scale for most major events and tests. And then there's going to be certain uh, instances where a 50 point um, scale is a little bit more appropriate, you know, so for something that maybe isn't as impactful or indicative of an athlete's total fitness, and it's kind of an augment of, of a bigger test, that's a good place that a 50 point scale might make sense. Or if it's more of a niche skill or a niche capacity, that's another place that it might make sense to weight that a little bit less than, than the hundred point norm. That's the perfect transition. As we shift to the start of the weekend, we have test one a and test one B. And as we look at test one a, I, uh, I immediately saw it. I was like, okay, I see, I see some rowing. I see some double runners. I see some running and the shuttle runs are back for the, the age groupers here. And as I look at it, like, <laughs> oh, man. Um, I mean, we, you want to talk about that first? Well, I was just going to say, yeah, I mean, there's, that was a big talking point for a lot of people, right? They're like, oh, shuttle runs nope. again. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I get it. I'm sorry. <laughs> if we had a better way to test running, then I, you know, it would be in there for sure. But again, it's like, okay, I think running, you can categorize really nicely in mm -hmm. two extremes. You've got distance running, you've got sprinting. And then, you know, the third is obviously kind of middle distance. Uh, when you only have one way to test that via the yeah. shuttle, it looks the same, but again, hopefully the, um, the outcome is a little bit different, you know, 50 at a time in the quarters versus much smaller numbers here. I had a conversation the other day about that is like, it's, it's much easier say at the games is like, yeah, okay. We have sprinting. We got some yep. zigzag. We got a 400 meter test. We've got a 5k. We've got 800 bookends or 400 meter repeats. Like all of those have different stimuluses when you for when sure you at that and with a shuttle run, Though you can do that, it does pose a, a, a unique challenge to try to elicit that same, I guess, feeling that you're you're trying to go for. Yeah. Yep. For sure. Uh, this test, I mean, I look at that is uh, <clears throat> I see a partition triple threes esque when, when we, uh, we see the three of those. Was that was that the uh, kind of the the baseline foundation for this one? You nailed it. I mean, that was absolutely the inspiration. There's no bones about it. And, um, you know, it's kind of fun again, when we're talking about divisions that have athletes that have been in the game a long time, like hopefully some of them had a little bit of that recognition. They're like, Oh, I remember seeing that. Mm. Or maybe even I participated in that cause I've been around that long. <laughs> um, you know, but yes, this was absolutely the inspiration for that. And, uh, you know, if we talk about it kind of broadly, um, it's hard, not hard, but you're more limited when you create tests that are all monostructural. Mm -hmm. for example, you know, so you've got a lot more options when it comes to weightlifting and gymnastics. Um, but you're a little bit more limited when you're just looking at, all right, just monostructural movements. And, and that's what I really wanted to see at this stage was an all monostructural test. When, when you look at these three and you had the shuttle runs in here, I think everyone, it, regardless of their feeling of seeing shuttle runs again, are probably thankful that they didn't have to do three miles worth of shuttle runs in a partition fashion, either or. So I, th I think you're being very generous with the, uh, <laughs> the numbering system you had in place here. When you look at the- Sorry, I was stuck on mute there for a second. My oh, yeah. dogs were, were barking. <laughs> um, yeah, the, uh, I'll talk about that rep scheme a little bit. Um, the whole point there was if we weigh too heavily on rowing with something like this in an all monostructural mm -hmm. test, uh, you know, like rowing is one of those things that absolutely favors a body type. There's no question about yeah. that. You know, that's rowing has a, a heavyweight division and a lightweight division. I mean, there's, there's a reason for that. And so when I was looking at this and kind of speculating as to how long it was going to take and looking at some of the testing data, the idea was, okay, the double unders and the run need to give enough of an opportunity so that somebody who can just dominate on the rower Mm -hmm. has to keep going on the other two elements. Or if I'm maybe not as great a rower, I can try to make my move on these other two. So it was a balancing effect there. I like that. Boz, when you, when you look at like the overall order of the weekend, then, and we, we open up with this, you know, monostructural piece, longer time domain, is there, 
an intentionality behind like, okay, I want to see what these athletes can do here fresh prior to higher bouts of power output. And how does that fit in with places? The first one. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of times, again, it's easy to kind of be seduced by the barbell, you know, and certainly there's plenty of barbells over this weekend. Um, but it's, it's one thing to have to come into the competition and put your foot on the gas during an all monostructural test and know that everybody's fresh and you don't have the excuse of, well, I'm fatigued from these other types of uh, movements that might be more my bread and butter. Um, so yes, there was an intentional choice there to put the longest and probably the least comfortable as far as like what most people prefer to do uh, test at the beginning. Yes. See, I'm the weirdo that I was like, please this, but we'll get to three, eight, a little bit. I'm like, mm -mm. <laughs> I am not, uh, Chase, I you am, and I were similar in that regard. Absolutely. I am not that guy, but that one hits me. <laughs> hits, me, hits me right in the skinny. I just uh, so right good. in the skinny. Good. Right in the skinny. Is there like a weak bone? Because I, I think that's what I have. I have a, a weak bone. But um, so you take that long monostructural test, and you f go right into at the at the completion, whether you're capped or you finished, is that you have three minutes to do as many snatches as possible at two twenty five and one fifty five. So we, I, I look at this as almost like that what is CrossFit lectures. We're hitting both sides of that spectrum between um, what we would consider like an endurance specialist or a strength specialist in that middle, that middle of the road CrossFit athlete or individual that we try to strive for in the methodology. Is this some of that bleeding into the, the test for test B and bringing in the heavy weight after the long aerobic test? Oh yeah, no question. I mean, this is quintessential CrossFit. It's not who's strongest, it's who's strongest under different conditions. Who's strongest when they're fatigued? Who's strongest when their heart rate's through the roof? Um, you know, those are the more interesting questions when you're looking at the breadth of fitness that we're trying to achieve and test for. And again, this throws back to many early prototype CrossFit Games events. I mean, you look back to, was it 2010? They had the Pyramid mm -hmm. Helen followed by the Max Jerk. I mean, that was at the time, it was like, what, you want us to lift heavy when we're out of breath and, and fatigued? It's like, yes, that's the whole point. Um, so, yeah, there's a big, big throwback to this. And, uh, again, just, hey, great. You're good at one end of the spectrum. Let's see if you can hit it out of the park. That gives the me other. nightmares to think oh, about. Cause all I remember is running around that track behind Jason Kalipa going, how is he running faster than me? I don't understand. What's going on? Hey, man, bears are fast <laughs> on land. People, people discount it, but uh, they they really are. It's it's so true. That was before. Really accelerated his running too. My goodness, I know. That's how. Yeah, I was shocked because that was the only thing I was good at, and it was not working in that event. <laughs> Oh man. Well, Boz, when I look at this test, I, I really, you know, think about it from an athlete perspective and, and I'm like, there's no doubt about the fact that a lot of, you know, myself and a lot of my peers can, can snatch 225, but do I have the capacity and the resiliency to snatch it one under duress, but more importantly, like after I hadn't snatched for 20 minutes prior, mm -hmm. like, do I have enough in reserves yeah. there? And, and, and I, I'd love to know like your, your process, uh, behind like, yeah, listen, this is, this is the load and this is the way it's going to play out after this, uh, monostructural piece. Yeah, for sure. Well, a couple of things on that too. Like we did allow competitors, you know, within that three minutes, it was their time. If they wanted to do some warm up lifts in there, mm -hmm. then great. It's just your time. And the only one that count uh, that counts are, uh, at that prescribed load. So, you know, they did have that opportunity if they needed it. Uh, on the other hand, though, I look at the competitive experience when we get to live competition and, you know, some people kind of balked at this idea. It's like, wow, man, I haven't done anything on the barbell for 15, 20 minutes. I'm like, well, that's going to be the experience at the games, <laughs> bar none. You get called into your mm -hmm. corrals, you're waiting to go on the field, you take the field. I mean, there's time there from the time that you've stopped your warm up until the time that you get to play just built into the logistics of the competition. And so that to me is one of those things. It's like, yep, you're right. In a normal training session, would I want to structure my training that way? Probably not. But am I going to need to be prepared to do it if I want to get to that next level and excel at that next level? That shouldn't be something that you're looking at and saying, Ooh, I wonder that should be something that you're like, yep, 
I am prepared for this like I'm prepared for so many other things. Boz, we had this question in quarterfinals when we talked about the max clean of doing a maxed lift versus the teams and the individuals that did reps at a certain weight. And we had talked about the difficulty of tiering that weight with, with, within those divisions. We have that here, but is that a product of less people, more of a defined group or type of athlete with the 30 in all divisions? Did that make it easier to tier these weights for this particular test that they didn't have in quarterfinals? Absolutely. And it's a little bit of a challenge still. Um, you know, I'm still going to go back and comb through the results. I haven't had a chance to do that fully yet. And we're going to do the comparison and see, okay, how close did we get? Um, but yeah, at the quarterfinals, when we have such large divisions, again, you're going to see a pretty wide range, even within the most competitive divisions, you know, mm -hmm. the younger divisions, particularly, you're still going to have people at the top that get lots of reps in a situation like this. And, and those at the bottom that just can't get any, uh, that obviously becomes less of an issue as we move forward to fields of 30. Now in some of the divisions, it is still quite a big spread. Uh, the older divisions in particular, you'll see the top of the leaderboard, you know, they'll have 10, 15 reps, maybe close to 20. And then you'll still have a significant portion of the field that cannot get a single rep. So it is a challenge to try to land on the right conditions for something like this with, with, you know, so many divisions and such a wide range between them. I feel like when you see that discrepancy, even if you think about first and 30th places at first may get, you know, we've seen say in the, the 35 division for the men upwards to 14 to 15 reps and some with zero. But there was a steady, mm -hmm. it looked like a consistent, slow decrease in numbers as you go from top to bottom. And, and that yep. seemed apparent in most yep. all divisions. I haven't combed through all of them, but the ones that I've seen, that, that's, that's a pretty natural thing to happen when you have, like, like you said, a somewhat of a niche test in weightlifting under fatigue with this. I, I think that's not uncommon to, to see. And, and I think actually, I mean, depending on the how many maybe got zero, it's an okay thing to see from time to time. At this Absolutely. Level. Absolutely. Yeah. And especially at the semifinals level, like, you know, I, I don't think that we're shying away from difficult things at this point that may stop you. I mean, and that's true for all parts of the season, but particularly so as we get to this final sorting before we get to the big show, um, because, Hey, you know, I think anybody who's competed at the games knows that there's going to be some things that you show up and you're like, man, this is a home run for me and I love it. And then there's going to be things where you're like, well, it's going to be a long time looking at the floor because this is just a little bit beyond me and, and that's the games. So, yeah. Well, as we close out test one, a and one B, uh, as we talked about early in the show, one, a worth the hundred total points, one B being those 50 total points. And you touched on, is that a type of specialist style test? And when you looked at max reps, or even if it were a max lift in this format, would you yeah. even like, so say formatting, Say it was a max snatch in that time remaining. Would you have had the same scoring system for the same reasons? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'd have to think about that a little bit more. But but speaking about this one in particular, again, with such a tight reps race, we knew that they were going to be low. We knew the difference between, you know, first and 10th was probably going to be only a couple of reps. Um, and we also knew that it was a very short time frame. And, and you know, this is pretty, pretty niche thing uh, to be able to, tack on to the end of the main course, so to speak. And so the situation that you don't want to have happen is let's say you and I are racing chase and, uh, you get 20 minutes on the first part and I get 15 minutes. I'm way better than mm -hmm. you on that one, but you beat me by two reps on the, on the snatch and you can overcome that mm -hmm. five yeah. minute deficit. <laughs> something that like objectively is like, Hey man, you really weren't that hot at that one, but you made up for, you could kind of hide it in, yeah. in, in, in a sense. So we wanted to make sure that we avoided that. And I think it's a, a great reason. And even if it was like, or the flip side, which is the the less competitive side is like, I decide to just go slow on the first one, knowing right. I got a right. good hundred pointer coming up. So I don't want to do anything in this one to take away even less possible points for me with that type of incentive. Yep. Yeah, exactly. All right, so we had long in A, we've got heavy in B, and then here comes test number two. And we have that five minute, as you had put, a little choose your own adventure style test where you have oh. thrusters oh, at it. 135 and 95 mm -hmm. for the main base divisions and ring muscle ups. The minimum number had changed. And I think before we get into it is that you basically had a minimum number you had to get of both. 
And then once you've achieved that, however you wanted to, it was really just total reps completed in the five minutes. When did you want or know you're like, Hey, I want to put something in here that, you know, athletes don't have a full definitive task to tackle and we're going to let them kind of choose their own path. 2009. Oh, okay. Ser- serious <laughs> answer, but, uh, <laughs> well, Hey man, it is the age group and you know, majority masters here. So let's take a little trip down memory lane. Way back in 2009, we did a qualifier. It was a NorCal qualifier at the time. And um, shout out, it was uh, Mike Minium from CrossFit Oakland at the time, Austin Begeebing, myself, and a couple other uh, kind of key players from the, the Bay Area, of California that, that put that on. Yeah. And uh, we approached Dave and asked him if we could do it at the ranch. And he's like, yeah, absolutely. So we did the 2009 NorCal qualifiers at the ranch. And one of the events that we did, I remember it very clearly, uh, was power cleans at 185 and muscle ups. And it was an undefined time. I believe it was mm-hmm. eight minutes. <clears throat> and um, it was, uh, I think at the time it was 10 reps oh. each that the competitor okay. needed to get. And, you know, you, you have to think back. These were the early I was days. Say, like, that's a lot. Muscle ups. In 2009. <laughs> yeah. 10 muscle ups to the average competitor at that stage, uh, you know, was pretty significant. That was like, oh, man, this is, this is going to be a separator. Mm-hmm. But once you got past that threshold, it was game on. You could do whatever you liked. And 185 also for reps was no picnic for athletes at that stage. How far have we come? You know, it's pretty amazing to see. Um, And so the idea there was, hey, okay, if you have somebody who's a gymnastic specialist, they can make their money somewhere. And if you have somebody who's just a brute on the barbell, they can make their money. But they have to have enough of the edges rounded off on the other side to get a chance to play. And so that was the genesis of this. I was like, man, that was a really fun thing to watch and to watch the way people chose to strategize. Let's bring it back. And so, yeah, we landed here. I like it. And I think you're absolutely messed up for throwing it out there. That's what I'll just say. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> here, here's here's where again i'm coming in with the athlete perspective it's like yo man if i'm in my garage and i know i gotta do this or i'm at my gym and i got my judge and my people in my mind i'm just like okay but how's scott gonna do this how, how, how how's rich gonna do this like yeah. in my yeah. you know Absolutely. and so i love the psychological battle that is taking place here it's not just me in this particular you know rep scheme of this couplet it's like okay now i gotta figure you know how i can just marginalize their their fitness by one or two reps um because initially i looked at this and i was like okay well maybe i'm just gonna bang out 15 muscle ups and then just amrap these thrusters the rest of the time (laughs) that sounds (laughs) oh no and a lot of competitors it does a lot of competitors took that route uh, that that road i was really surprised actually at how many people chose to just like all right i'm gonna get all my muscle ups and then i'm just gonna go for it on the barbell (laughs) for three yeah. minutes and 30 seconds. I was like, Oh, that sounds like my nightmare. But, um, but I will say that you did see a whole host of approaches and it was really cool. And, and I think, I mean, Panchik is the obvious example. I watched, uh, the way mm. he approached this. And from what I could tell, he had, uh, the strategy that he was going to do manageable sets on the barbell that didn't break the bank. And every time he broke, he would go get a set oh, of wow. muscle ups. And so he was constantly moving back and forth until about the last minute. And I think that's how he got the edge on some of these other players that decided, hey, I'm just going to go for broke on the barbell because he did sneak in a couple extra reps while people were taking a look at that bar after some monster set. And that just pays a tribute to the guy's gymnastics capacity. Because me, once I hit Mm -hmm. 15 muscle up, once I hit five, that press out is no longer as sharp in and steady as it was out of the dip. And the thrusters are only going to make me worse at that. So... Well, you're, you're, you're talking about a gentleman that, uh, you know, has squatted 500 pounds in competition. So I don't think the, uh, I don't think the press out is really the limiting factor for him and the thruster. <laughs> when you look at the, the, the small nuances here. So, you know, you talked about the, you, you guys said heavier power cleans in an eight minute time frame, And here we have a five minute time frame with, with thrusters. You know, how did you land on this time frame? And then on the flip side it was like the, this decision between do we do rings or do we do uh, bar muscle ups? Where did you guys tinker with that? Yeah, um, the well, so a couple things there. The five minute time frame was kind of dictated by what else was okay. happening across the weekend. So it was pretty obvious that we needed a, a shorter event. You know, something that was a little more sprinty, kind of go for broke, not a lot of pacing. So that fit the bill based on what was happening around it pretty nicely. 
Um, and then as far as the rings versus the bar, I think for most people, and so we wanted that skill to be the one that was highlighted. Okay. On this, <clears throat> excuse me, when you are putting this choose your own adventure format and you know, with the thrusters combined with the rings, which is yeah. just a, it's a dirty combo. I'll just, you know, yeah, throw it out for there. sure. <laughs> is in, in this five minute time frame. And I, I think we've touched on this a few times, but you said it's like, okay, we, we needed a, a, a shorter time frame. But in time caps and or time caps or time frames in general, you know, aside from say what the movements are, the type, the weight, the skills, do you look at time caps or time frames as a way to also play with some necessary intensity to be successful at some of these things outside of what the movements are or, or modalities? Yeah, but less so during online competition, I would say. I think that, you know, for the most part, the competition is going to drive results, especially when you're in a blind situation, meaning you don't know what your other competitors are doing. You know, like regardless of the time cap, you're like, man, I can't see the field. I better put my best foot forward because I don't know what the other guys are going to turn in for their scores. So like, it's kind of not an option. So uh, during the online stages of the season, the time caps are often pretty generous unless we're like, okay, we just, we need to cut it off because it's just going to compound other things, you know? Um, but when we get to live competition, absolutely time caps can be used as a tool and are used as a tool to uh, start to put some pressure on the competitors because you do see a bit of a leveling effect when you're out there and you have the top heat and they all, you can see it. It's almost like a bit of an agreement. It's like, okay, this guy's going to take first place and everybody else is going to kind of fall in. Oh yeah. But without that externality of the time cap, um, you know, Maybe they took their foot off the gas a little bit. Yeah. So that can encourage it. But I do think it's a more powerful tool during live comp. So I, less, I just, less of a factor here. I just pulled up Scott's number in 81. Crazy, oh, right? What? Yeah. What? <laughs> Very impressive. <laughs> well, and five hey. Five minutes. Last, yes. It, isn't that wild? Oh, I mean, it's, uh, it's a lot of work in, in a short amount of time. It's almost like that's a, a formula for something. <laughs> uh, all you CrossFit heads out there. But um <laughs> The the really cool thing here is we talked about it last time uh, when we were talking about quarterfinals. It's like, hey, man, these are desert island movements. You show me somebody who's really good at thrusters and muscle-ups in like all sorts of combinations. And I'll show you a guy who's really, really fit. And there it is. I mean, it's right there. Uh, well, what is it? We got Scott Panchik, Paul Tremblay, Rich Froning as your top three in that test. Yep. I would say check. Fit dudes. <laughs> fit dudes. Um, all right. So as we shift gears from day one to day two, event two to three A and three B. Uh, and hold on. I don't mean that. Well, I am. I do mean to. I, did, yeah. Have you guys tried that one? Because that of all these tests. I really that, want to once I am okay. able to. Because <laughs> that was the one uh, out of this weekend that I probably got more messages from people within affiliates that were like, we're doing this on Friday. You know, <laughs> I can't wait to try it out. You know, uh, what would you recommend? Uh, so it's kind of cool to see the community engage with this one too. Mm. Um, you know, it lots of people that were like, oh, kind of fun to play around with this format. So yeah. I think that's always great too. And, and, and another highlight for like some of the most positive aspects of competition is for people to try to get their hands on it and, and to be compelled to do so. So, well, and I, I love seeing that trickle effect into the community after a competition. And usually people pick the worst ones. <laughs> I remember the marathon row and everyone's like hmm. doing it in the gym tomorrow. I'm like, what? <laughs> Why? So, yeah, we Why? Saw people making up their own capital events at their affiliates. What I thought was really cool. That's cool. I understand that the marathon the row, man. Double cross under <laughs> tickets out or, uh, you know, stories yeah. out there that came after the games. You know, when, when eh, this is off topic, but like when you see that happen, there, there's one thing as a, as you know, for a programming event, it's cool to see the athletes take the test. It's cool to see how they enjoy it and interact with that. But what is the feeling like when you see the community like get excited about your test and then want to do it on their own after the fact? Oh, it's terrible. I mean, I, they should just leave that to the pros. No, of course. I mean, that's that's one of the greatest compliments I think that you can be given is when it's like, hey, somebody that doesn't have a prize purse on the line, they're just interested in this stuff. They love it for its own sake. 
And they've taken time out of their training schedule to include this thing that you thought was a good idea. Like, of course, that feels great. You know what I mean? That's a, that's a very high compliment. And it's, it's a, a very genuine compliment, in my opinion, because it's one thing to say, hey, I like the way it looked on TV. It's another to say, I liked it enough that I want to do it. That's, mm. that's a lot of commitment. So, yeah, it's big. Yeah, I think that's a, it, it's, it's, it's a cool thing to see when you see the, the community want to interact and, and play along. Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. Athletes when it comes to that. So shifting and, gears. Oh, go and, ahead. And, well, and I think that that's, uh, you know, it's, it's been highlighted plenty of times over the years, but I think it's worth highlighting every chance we get. That really is one of the big differences between what we do, particularly on the competition and sports side versus a lot of other sports. It's like, you know, you don't really have the opportunity to get a bunch of people together and play a game of basketball. Maybe you do once in a while, but it's not, not with any sort of like regularity for most of us. Um, whereas, on the CrossFit side, it's like, that's part of our whole ethos is like, yeah, everybody does it and yeah, yeah they're going to do it at the level that they're at, but they want to get their hands on it. And I think that's just so cool. So anyway. And I think bringing that up to the forefront is something that I've noticed with the last year and things that you've put in the competition floor that others may have forgotten where it came from or that it's okay. And what I've liked and I've seen is that it feels like the lab is opening back up a little bit, right? It's like, okay, we're, hey, wall facing. That was taught in like one of the very first gymnastic seminars I ever saw on video by Carl Paoli saying, you have to face the wall before you can ever put your back to the wall. Mm -hmm. Or the idea is like, you got to have a strict pull before we do kipping or muscle up or things like right. that. And seeing those things open up now, uh, I think has been a cool byproduct and hopefully the affiliate side too is like it doesn't have to be this box that we've been in we can open the lab back up try new things and to see that on display and people take that back to their affiliate or take that back to the garage or take that back to their group of friends wherever they want to do it i think it's been a pretty cool byproduct uh so far yeah and i you know i i think that um i got the benefit of being the new guy so to speak and so there's going to be change just inevitable with that but that's nothing new i mean that's something that's been a staple forever i mean you think about the first time 20, 2008 we did a chest to bar friend and people were like you can do chest to bar pull ups what <laughs> yeah. you know like it was like a revelation and then for a year everybody's just cranking out chest to bar so you know that sort of filtering down through the community that that's nothing new and and it's uh, you know in my opinion i think that should remain a staple um and i think it's always going to be a good sign when we have people with no competitive uh, aspirations still wanting to get their hands on this stuff. So, yeah. One more thing. Speaking of filtering, how does this look to you, sir? I've oh, been looks smooth. It looks impressive. These, yeah. I've been seeing all these athletes out there working on their devil under crossovers. And yep. you know, a year ago, we were hoping we'd see one person get through that skills test. And now it's, a, it's a new skill. It's a new yep. arrow in the quiver. Turns out these people are really fit and really dedicated and they can pick up things pretty quickly and make them look great. So yeah, shout out to the competitors doing their homework. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. All right. As we shift to 3A, 3B, starting day number two, you look at the format. It's a three-part weightlifting, uh, I don't want to say complex, so to speak. As we, we look at the three bars, we have deadlifts cleans and then shoulder overhead weight being 185 and 135 you also threw in an interval based test two minutes of work one minute of rest for five sets i look at this is is this an offset a little bit to balance out a test 1a we have that three-part monostructural and we kick it back over to a three-part weightlifting for sure it's a basically an inversion not quite not a true inversion but pretty close you know, we started off with this monster monostructural only style event, and then we threw in the kind of augment of a pure weightlifting. So now we've got a weightlifting only event augmented by a pure gymnastic skill. So yeah, kind of an inversion of a, or I'm sorry, one. Now I'm going to kick this back to you guys as analysts of the sport oh. and, and active participants in all things CrossFit for many years. Can you guess the basis of this workout? It's, it doesn't, it didn't end up looking exactly like it, but there's definitely a base workout that I drew the inspiration from here and it's old school. Uh, I was, well, okay. So without being trapped, I see complex. So I think most people will say DT. However, with the interval base and the movement styles, I was going to say the chief. Conway. Equal, equally 
the chief was my assumption. Correct. The yeah. chief was the <laughs> the chief was the basis uh, for the inspiration behind this one. I love the chief. I think it's such a great workout. If you oh, it, you should go love it. It. go do it. Nice. <laughs> all all time favorite. All time Me favorite. Too. It's such a good one. Uh, I pull that one out every couple of months. I just love it. And I was like, man, something like the chief would be really cool to put into mm. competition. Actually, the working title on our internal document was the big chief. Oh, so, nice. So there you go. <laughs> um, yeah. I'll never forget my first chief where I was new, but maybe overly confident as uh, you know, most young athletes coming out of college could be. Shocker. And uh, I have never looked at a 135 pound power clean the same after that <laughs> round two. <laughs> oh man. How about just like regular basic body weight movement? I'd never looked yeah. at those the same after doing the first chief. You're like, like what? Nine squats. <laughs> yeah. Come on. No problem. And then like, yeah, <laughs> round three, I was like, what is happening to my body? <laughs> yep. When you looked uh the weight cho choice. So we have the seven deadlifts, five cleans, three shoulder overhead, 185 and 135. Uh, not just the weight choice for both, but specifically that women's weight of 135. We've seen 125 um, in tests, whether it's quarterfinals or online semifinals. And now we see 135 here. What was the decision to land on these weights and then bump that women's weight up a little bit on that baseline weight? Yeah, the test needed to be something mid-range, meaning something that wasn't so light that it was just going to be hands on the bar and they never come off and it's just reps, 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 reps. On the other hand, it couldn't be heavy enough to stop anybody, uh, meaning like I just didn't have the strength to continue going. So we needed a bit of a mid-range for this particular test. And uh, it was actually on the, you know, so a little insight to the process. People often think it's a one-man show. It's not. You know, my job is to create the, uh, the big picture. Then I bring it to my team. My team tries to poke holes in it and tell me why it sucks. And then <laughs> That's explicitly my, my instruction to them is like, hey, tell me why it sucks. Let's make it better. And um, one of the things that came out of that review process was, you know what? If we're looking for this true mid-range, 125 for a lot of these women is just going to be bouncing around. Like mm. the 135 is way closer to the feel of the 185 for the men. And oftentimes, again, in uh, competitions like this that are online decentralized, you know, sometimes we err on the side of what's easier to load. At which yeah. 125 is for a women's bar, but the 135 made way more sense when we consider the effect of the load. Another thing that I look at here, Boz, too, is we kind of breaking down the the weight, the load, of course, and then even the the selection of the movements. You know, um, with the seven deadlifts into five cleans, whereas as I as I noticed, you know, in my mind, a natural theme would be seven deadlifts five hand cleans, three shoulder overhead, right? Me naturally comparing it to DT, me thinking about, you know, where the bar is already within our grip and then linking reps together or being more forced almost to link reps together. Um, now, I personally really like that these are cleans. That's, <laughs> that's besides the fact. Why are they coming from the ground again in this second Living that movement within life. the barbell? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's really no, uh, there's no academic, uh, <laughs> like yeah. cute answer for this one. It's harder. And I thought it would be better. <laughs> hey. Yeah. So the, uh, the, the, from the floor is way more fatiguing. I think nobody's going to argue that. And, um, you know, we had a ton of squatting with the thrusters and the, the test, uh, prior. So I really like a lot of hinging here and it's harder. You're going to get more gassed going from the floor than you would from the hang. So. Mm -hmm giddy up can i can i just say one another thing that i really like is that it kind of uh you know almost takes away the ability for these barbell specialists to just slap the bar off their thigh and uh, rebound it back up to sure. their shoulders uh, like it, you know and, and i'm not saying it's a skill that people shouldn't develop and shouldn't go for it hey we're racing sure, when we compete yep. no doubt about it but it seems like there's there's a way sometimes that that athletes tend to try their best to pervert a, a sound movement into something that sometimes looks a little off or even makes it harder to judge, honestly. So coming up from it's like, okay, we see that's a good rep and it looks clean the whole way. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, you see that in any um, sport where people start to understand what's going to be required of them and they move to be as efficient as possible with that. I mean, that's mm. any good competitor is going to do that. Absolutely. But again, when we're talking about fitness, the question is, has to be okay who can do that but who is also still good when they can't do that you know what i mean so it's got to be both for, i'm for, terrible at that 
You want to win Same. the CrossFit Games? You cannot rely on like, I'm really good at this one style of efficiency. I'm just like, it's like a car crash for me. I've tried to do that little like rebounding with like 95. I saw Sam Dancer do that with like 315 one time. <laughs> How do your shoulders... Well, I know I've seen his shoulders, but I still can't think of the, yeah, there you go. It's like, and my arms are too yeah, long. If bro, if you, if you were a, a girl having to wear skirts at high school, it's like, you would have had that below the knee length, <laughs> the, the length on that arm, but, um, so long. <laughs> so long, but that this forays into test three B. So we had the weightlifting interval test and then we get upside down and it's back, baby. I was wondering if we'll ever see this thing again. We saw this pop up in the 2020 online games, uh, basically stage one, and it's established a one minute freestanding handstand hold. I think, believe it's a four by four foot box. And uh, I mean, it's pretty straightforward, pretty simple, but after a test that did not make it either one of those, I think coming into that handstand, was that, was that also intentional? If, oh, okay, we're sure. going to have this blast furnace you know, intensity tests. And now let's see you get really like, you know, on your hands and inverted. Yeah, for sure. And, and for the same reason that we talked about in one, you know, okay, it's great that you can lift heavy, but what about under different conditions? This is exactly the same thing. You know, you're going to have some people that their gymnastic skills are just, you know, they're stellar and that's great, but do they fall apart when they are pre-fatigued? Uh, what does it look like when the shoulders have had how many reps of a, a pretty, you know, stout barbell overhead? Those are different questions. And so, yeah, to parallel that first one, it made sense that this is going to be done in a fatigued state as well. What I thought was really cool to see is that I know it's just a sample of, I don't say just a sample of 30, but as a sample of 30 is that there were more closely finished placing for some of these top 10 athletes, then there were a spread. Because oftentimes you would see this like, hey, I got third in the barbell test, but 20th in the Hansen test or vice versa. I saw a lot of athletes that were top five in both sitting up there mm -hmm. in the top 10. And I thought that was a really cool, like I'll, you know, I don't know how far back I need to go, but 10 years ago, you're not really seeing as much of that as we are now. And I think that's just an evolution of, not the sport in general, but maybe like not the sport specifically, but training and athletes in general, giving more time and in, 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 in practice in CrossFit. Yeah, it's great. It's great to see it. And I think you're spot on. You know, it's not enough to have some really, really good strengths and then some things that you're like, yeah, it's just going to beat me up a little bit on the scoreboard. You, you just won't make it anymore. People are too good. People are too well-rounded. And that is certainly filtering down into a lot of these master's categories and uh, you know the, the, the younger divisions as well uh, with the teenagers. So I think that's really just what we're going to continue to see as we push the games further and further, you know, is, yeah, you, you have to have everything be very, very high level. Um, wow. And really beyond that, you just can't have something that's going to tank you. You know, if you have some, if you have that thing that is just going to stick out and be a glaring thorn in your side, like you're definitely going to pay for that on the leaderboard. 315 pound deadlifts. Check. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So let's shift gears to the final event of the weekend. And that was test number four. We had the buy-in of the burpee box jump overs. Two rounds, 20 kettlebell step-ups with a single 70 and 53 into two rope climbs, followed by two rounds of 20 goblet squats and two legless rope climbs to 10 feet and the cash out with the burpee box jump over. And I think the biggest one, that thing that jumped off the page to most people was the 20-inch box that you put for the box jump overs and the step-ups that usually we've seen at 20 what went into the decision to lower that box height? Was that across the board or more towards a particular movement in this test? Um, well, it's been pointed out a few times and, and again by um, some members of our competition team that was reviewing some of these. It's like, hey, you know, oftentimes when we look at the difference between men and women, you could say that the men are getting kind of a double death in the sense that not only is it higher, but it's also heavier. So it's like, it's a doubling up of effort on mm. something. So it's like, well, why don't we keep one element the same knowing that the other is going to change? The kettlebell weight obviously is going to change. 
But what happens if we just keep the box the same? And um, you know, they can deal with that by going faster because it's quote unquote easier. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so go for it. Um, and also, I think that particularly for the step up, that's that compounding effect is really present. You know, the difference between getting your leg up those last four inches mm. um, is huge. And I would say maybe more impactful than the difference between a 70 pound and a 53 pound kettlebell, frankly. So anyway, it was just something that we wanted to experiment with. It's like, okay, if we're going to modify one thing for the, uh, the uh, different divisions, let's keep the other static and see what happens. I like it. <clears throat> Boz, the thing that jumped out to me immediately was, of course, the the goblet, the goblet squat, the kettlebell, getting it in there. I love it. <laughs> first, first time we've seen it. I do <laughs> love it. Heck, I, <laughs> right I, before, since February. Yeah, and I and, and I got to see it firsthand even at the at the Rogue Invitational this yep. last fall. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. And I was I was like, oh, I wonder did that did that inspire you at all to to bring that 100%. in? I'm sure you pay attention. Okay. Well, and, and you know, and, there, and then and then there's other conversations where people are like, well, you know, this kind of reminds me of the V up, and I shouldn't I shouldn't imitate it in that voice. That's terrible. I shouldn't <laughs> try to imitate it. Oh, that's great. This was an actually. I, I thought it was. But they're like, hey, this is it an accessory piece? Does this have a space in competition? In my mind, I know my answer and I know where I stand, but I'm, I'm curious about you, where your stance is with this movement being present here, boss. Oh yeah. I mean, I would say that the implement is less important than the effect. Mm. Uh, and like to that end, if this was written as a 95 pound front squat, nobody bats an eye, even a 75 pound front squat, nobody bats an eye. It's like, why is it that different that you just have to hold it in a different way? Mm. Um, and so that I don't think carries a lot of water as far as an argument. Um, I'd also say that, Hey man, we talked a lot about CrossFitters getting their hands dirty. That's one of the best ways to discern if you think this is a good idea or not. It's one thing on paper, but watch it. And I'll tell you, uh, yeah, I'm not ashamed to admit this. One of the ways that I looked at this to try to see if it hit the mark, I pulled up Mr. Richard Froning Jr.'s video and I thought, okay, What's the champ looking like when he finishes this particular test? And you know what? It was no picnic for him. And if it, a guy like Rich Froning is having to work his butt off to finish something like this in a time that's competitive, I'm like, okay, there's something there. <clears throat> if it's good enough for Rich, I think it's good enough for the rest of us. Um, Can't argue that. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't know what his opinion was on the uh, particular <laughs> test. That might be another story. But at the end of the day, check Twitter. This, yeah, this is one of those things that, um, really it's kind of an accessible test. I know the legless rope climbs, uh, would be difficult for a lot of people, but if you look at this, there's not too many elements in there that you're like, Hey, given enough time, like most people could finish this. And so the question is who can really go for it and, and attack this the whole way through. I mean, this is all about, can I attack at every stage of this? And it goes by a lot quicker than I think you want it to for that mm -hmm. reason. That's the first thing I was thinking about when I was looking at this, because when I first opened, it, I was like, okay, we got a little grinder here, we got some rope climbs and kettlebell work. And then the more I looked at it, I was like, oh man, there's, there's nowhere you can take the gas, uh, your foot off the gas. Nowhere. Yeah. If, if you, if you want to make the top 10 with the divisions that you're in, you can't, you like, you have to, and that's going to make or, or shift the, as you said, the, the effect of that kettlebell in that rack position much more than I think people maybe gave it credit for until they did the test. Of just yeah. like, I have to hold on for this amount of time. I have to get to the rope and go back to it and then back to the rope and then back to it. And just that sitting in that position at the intensity these athletes have to go, I think is, is a very potent uh, combination. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's one of the factors that I think is harder to test when we're talking about fitness that's measured objectively through time and load and that sort of thing. But you know, the ability to maintain a position or like an isometric style hold, those are very difficult things to try to incorporate and they can have a really big impact as an interference effect on other things. So if we're looking at the, you know, the kettlebell hold, that's going to have a pretty big impact on the rope climb. And again, I've said this a million times and, you know, uh, competitors, I hope, I hope you're paying attention. It's like technique matters because if your rope climb technique in those first two rounds is mm -hmm. smooth and it's not arm heavy, you're probably not going to be that impacted by the kettlebell. And therefore you're going to be a little fresher when you get to the legless and you have to use your arms. So if you don't have that style of technique and you're kind of just grinding your way up that rope all the time, you're going to be in the different state than a lot of people that have smoother technique by the time you get to the legless. So again, it's, there's, 
it's I wouldn't say it's subtle. I mean, it's not that subtle. We're not <laughs> writing poetry here, you know, but uh, at the end of the day, it is kind of a fun way to just tinker with some things that, you know, hopefully put people on the back foot a little bit. And again, the best don't get rattled by it and they rise to it and they just do it because they're the best. Baza, I had one question um, in regards to modalities. So, you know, we have weightlifting, monostructural gy gymnastics. If we look at putting movements in certain categories, some bleed in between the two, but this had come up or, or has been discussed. Uh, I've seen in recent time when we're looking at or, or differentiating maybe like athletes in the elite sports and your general CrossFitters. So say like, you know, Fran for the top 10 at the CrossFit Games is just a, a different looking movement or test than it would be in your affiliate. And then you look at burpees sure, sure. or any version of burpees. And though they are, you know, moving your body in space as we would classify a gymnastics movement, when you look at the elites athletes, there's a conversation of burpees almost moving towards, or even boxing them to a certain extent, more of a monostructural cyclical movement style, like a row, a run, or a double under. You know, how do, how do you see that, or, or you know, what opinion do you have on that concept uh, of recent? Oh, I mean, I think people can categorize movements any way that they find useful. I mean, at the end of the day, really what you're trying to do is just create enough of a codified system that you can look at it and say, we've covered our bases effectively. So how, I, to me, I'm like the academic discussion around is a burpee, a monostructural movement or a gymnastics <laughs> movement. So I'm almost like, I, I don't care. Just categorize it one way and then be consistent mm. so that you can make sure that you've um, you know, got a good spread when it comes time to looking at the totality of a test. That's what's important. So um, and I guess you could kind of play that game with so many different things. So mm. like, if you're asking me, what's my opinion, I'm like, it's a gymnastics movement. It's just mm. easy in my mind to categorize that way. The effect is secondary because okay. let's look at a barbell, um, is a dead let's, let's look at a clean and jerk is a clean and jerk, a weightlifting movement. I would say yes. Great. Okay. So how about let's say a hundred clean and jerks with the open barbell. Is it still a weightlifting movement or by that definition that you talked about earlier, does it become more of a monostructural type effect? Okay. Sure. But I think nobody's going to say, well, it's no longer a weightlifting movement. You're like, it's just a different effect using a weightlifting movement. So to that end, I'm like, if you, if you're going to push me to, to say, what is it? I'm going to say it's a gymnastics thing, but like, yeah, the effect is going to be varied for sure. And, and varied very specifically by the capacities of some of the people that are engaging with it. Yeah. categorization tool, baby. That's, that's what we're looking for. It doesn't need to be much, uh, much more beyond that. <laughs> uh, just, like you get in the weeds, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Just like we teach in a programming lecture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Boz, when at, at the end of the day, we we've got our four tests or six tests in total four for a hundred points to four 50 points. And, you know, as we, as we look at this is how often do you, or, or not how often is like, so look at, quarterfinals tests and what we were trying to filter for and test with in that in the semis semifinal tests and how who we're trying to filter and, and move on is you know do you have certain things that you are trying to get out of that specifically other than say just names out of the hat well you're not trying to qualify particular names i just mean do you have like hey we're trying to test this to move this here and then test this to move this here do you do you look at that when you look at different stages of the competition not often. I mean, again, I think the games are the biggest, uh, you know, kind of push in that direction where I, I think you see that pretty regularly where something mm -hmm. introduced at the game starts to filter out and it, and it can start to influence, you know, not just competitors, but the community at large. Um, for something like the age group semis, no, it's, it's, you, you have to let the test and the competitors push that. And again, I'll come back to it all the time. I I'm like a dog with a bone. I, I, I will never not believe that some of the purity around basic things like a hundred meter dash or a one mile run, um, can really add a lot of insight to this. You know, like, I don't think anybody at the outset of saying, Hey, a 100 meter dash is a good thing to race. Nobody's saying, Hey, I think we should try to get this in a state where competitors are running like close to a nine second 100 mm -hmm. that just emerged as the competition unfolded over hundreds of years, millennia, whatever, however long people have been running hundred meter dashes. Um, 
And there's no like mastermind necessary for that because that emerges with the people engaging in it. And I think that's very true with CrossFit. Like there's certain elements that, yeah, you want to make sure that people are tested on them so that they don't forget or that they're guiding their training broadly. Uh, that's in line with what we're trying to get to at the end of the day. But to think that there's some sort of like mastermind, um, you know, total plan, I think discredits what will naturally emerge better via the competition and via athletes doing it. So is the CrossFit game set already? Is that what you're saying? You got the test also? <laughs> We're getting closer. I'll say that much. I mean, hey, man, the games is a, it's a complex beast and there's lots of little things that just get kind of tweaked all the way up there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we're getting, we're getting close. Buzz, do you look at, not do you look at, does the number of athletes taking the test influence what you program in or the certain stages of what you have said. Cause I know we said is like, we don't want to box ourselves in with like, this is only for the open. This is only for quarters, semis, finals, but it's like, Hey, we have 30 people versus 1500. Does that influence the way you program the tests at all when it comes to these divisions or, or, uh, what are, what are these things called stages? There we go. Words. I think the difference is the gulf between the best and the also rans. <clears throat> so not so much the um, total number of competitors, but what is the disparity between the best and the people that are just participating? I think that's that's got more to do with it. Um, and that's true for online competition. I mean, you know, look, the benefit of an online competition is that you can have mass participation. The benefit of a live competition is that there's other competitive things that you can't stress in an online format. But the downside to live competition is that logistics are way harder. You know, you have only so many hours in the day. You've only uh, got the ability to handle so many competitors. And so I guess that would be the only filter that sometimes comes into play when you're like, do we choose A versus B? Okay. Uh, it comes down to a logistics question when we get to in-person competition. But that's not the primary driver. The primary driver is like, what's the best test? We always want to start there. Mm -hmm. How can we get there? And then as we get further along and we look at, okay, well, we can do this, but it's going to be a 15 hour day. Like, okay, maybe we, maybe that doesn't need to be a 20 minute event. It's a 15 minute event. And that saves us three hours when you look at the <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe we can make that compromise. You know, that once in a while, something like that will happen, but it's starting with the big picture first, the competition and that the kind of the mm -hmm. purity of it is the first decision-making point. Should we, do you want to, uh, now I'm talking to athletes, but I just want to, <laughs> it was fun watching some athletes compete against each other again, even though it was on a virtual leaderboard. Oh yeah. How do we get rich to the games? I mean, I know he's, he's that's a question for rich. <laughs> I think it would just be nice to see that grouping. Like obviously nothing's finalized, but just seeing those names on there again, I was like, man, oh. I was having okay, such a blast good juice in that. <laughs> just thinking back to the old, uh, you know, central regional days of Panchik and Froning battling it out and just going toe to toe. I was like, ah, oh, this is just yeah. so cool to see it still unfolding in different ways. And I mean, hats off to all the competitors uh, and particularly, you know, so many people that have stuck around and, and continue to just surprise and delight. You know, mm -hmm. we'll say that it's, it's really cool. I saw that in the women's side. I see saw Sam Briggs in there mixing it up with Becca Voigt. Cheryl Bross so, is picking so it up good. there. And then, you know, a lot of the new names here is whether they've been new to the Masters Division and making a name for themselves, like Jen Ryan or Lori Clement and athletes like that. But to see some of the OGs out there on the leaderboard still mixing it up, still having success. I mean, Stacey Tovar had a great weekend. She's been on this podcast before. China Cho went out there. I mm -hmm. believe she's still on top as it stands. I don't want to speak too soon. But she did great. We'll just say that. Yep, she's still kicking it out there. Um, as just take yourself out of the, you know, take your programmer hat out, your, your director hat off, and just put a fan hat on. Is like when you look at this division in particular and seeing these athletes still out there and doing things, like how, how do you in, or do you like enjoy that just from a, a, a fan of the sport? 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I've been pretty public about saying that I think it's one of the most inspirational aspects of the games. Um, you know, the younger open men's and women's athletes, of course, you know, objectively, they are the fittest and they have that spotlight. But I just think that's such a cool shining light to see people that have navigated their life and still chosen to prioritize health and fitness in a way that isn't just something that's a passing interest when you're young. Uh, I think that's super powerful. I think it's really, really, really cool. And it's really important that um, people can look to that and say, hey, you know what, that could be me. And maybe it's not going to be the uh, me on the podium or like me dedicating my life to training. And, you know, that's it. But that could be me way better than I was last year. That could be me learning a new skill at 47 years old or 60 years old, or me taking on a challenge that I didn't even know was something I would be interested in at a stage in life that maybe I hadn't considered that even to be possible. Um, all of that, I think, is the uh, you know number one impact of the, the Masters divisions in particular. So yeah, as a fan, I mean, it's, uh, it's just great. I am um, I, I love I love seeing it, and uh, you know it's a it's a big honor to be able to yeah. put my um, kind of work into that. So yeah, happy to do it. I mean, we've seen Annie Sakamoto out there trying to do that press to handstand over the last. Yeah, what did she months. say? To, so cool. She's like, "Hey, I'm 18 years deep, and I'm still learning new things." Yeah. Like that's so great. I, I've I've given myself a challenge, and this reaches way way back to like early journal, but it was uh, I think it was the presses article that Greg wrote uh, with like '03. And he had that challenge of a press to handstand into a hundred foot unbroken handstand walk. And I was like, okay, because that will take me a long time to do, but the adaptation that I'll gain in the process of learning how to do that, regardless of how long it takes, as I'm 40 plus working to 50, is an avenue I've never really poured myself into extensively. And seeing Annie do that after I already wanted to, I was like, I... It, it was inspirational in, in ways that is, is hard to explain. So I, I do think it's cool to have them out there and leading from the front still. Well, boss, I appreciate you taking the time. It's been a fun couple of weeks just getting to pick your brain. I would love to do this with you every day because <laughs> it's just, just the nerdness that I pour myself into and, and watch what comes out is, is just really fun. So it, it really means a lot that you take the time to, uh, to sit down with Conway and I as we do this. Semifinals are coming up for the individuals. It'll, it will be spanning the world for three weeks from May to the early part of June as you get a, do you get a little bit of a break here or uh, is it still just a lot of logistics and fine tuning all the way up to week one of semifinals? May and June are going to be very, very busy months. And so, yeah, there's a, we're in full steam, just putting the final, I mean, you know, the major plans have been laid for quite some time with semis. Um, but with any big event, you know, as you draw closer to the date, there's a lot of I's to dot and T's to cross. So pretty busy with all that. Uh, very much looking forward to the semifinals. You know, if you guys are anywhere close to them those of you out there listening check them out there's going to be awesome experiences for fans to engage with some of the workouts to just see some amazing performances see some of your you know favorite athletes so get out there and support those events um yeah and then june is just going to be a, kind of a quick switch to a, a bunch of prep for the games you know we have all sorts of um things that we need to uh finalize at that stage and um it's just kind of that slide into the finals so looking forward to it uh, I'm really excited for semifinals. I know Conway and I will have the pleasure of being out there for the East one. We get to uh, you know be behind the Orlando. screen. Yeah, we'll see you in Orlando. And you know, I you know touched us on the lit uh, just briefly, but if you guys are going out to the semifinals, they got announced I think last week of spectator workouts. Is it one per day? And it's not just going to be held at the local affiliate or somewhere in the parking lot, but in our what is it European? West and East semifinals, they're getting an opportunity to be a semifinals athlete in a sense of being able to go out on the floor and uh, partake in some fitness and on the competition floor that people can sign up for. Everybody's yeah. going to get a taste of one of those events. Are we going to do one of those, Conway? We're going to sign hey, up for a heat. If, if we can I make it happen, like let's make, if we can get free, we got to make it happen. 
<laughs> I feel like you guys should do all three and you should make a thing of it and see who comes out on top. I mean, let's go. Let's oh, <laughs> we could have a leaderboard. I mean, the whole thing. Listen, I'm going to tell you who's going to win that, but I'm still going to try. <laughs> <laughs> well, boss, again, thank you so much, Conway. I appreciate your, uh, your, your, uh, moving your schedules around. I know we had to shift some things and some gears here, but, uh, boss, again, it's always a pleasure. It's a, it's a, it's fun to watch you work and, and see you in your element. And, uh, I really thank you for your time and, uh, your accessibility here. So hope you guys enjoyed the show. Get out to semifinals. Get on the work. Uh, well, Conway and I will tell you the heat we're signing up for. How about that? You guys see us in the East. In the West, you guys should get out there in Europe as well. I think it's going to be an awesome time for spectators and athletes alike. Until then, keep getting inside your affiliate. Keep working out. Keep getting coached. And keep your eyes open for those broadcasts if you can't be there in person. Until next time, thank you guys for joining the show. We'll see you back in May.